And so in the interest of time, because doing transposition in 15 minutes or less is, is a fairly daunting thing, I'm going to skip a bunch of slides. So don't, don't be confused um, when I just start skipping around. Um, transposition of the great arteries, pretty straightforward, right? The aorta is coming off the right ventricle. The pulmonary artery is coming off the left ventricle. You have these two uh, parallel circulations. Blue blood keeps going to the body. Pink blood keeps going to the lungs. Very inefficient system, obviously. Specifically, D transposition. What's the D for? The D's for dextro, because in this disorder, the aorta is rightward and anterior. That will um, be different than L transposition, which we will talk about in like two slides right at the very end of this. Um, about 5% of congenital heart disease, these tend to be boys, often infants of diabetics. So for the pediatricians out there, you know, the test question is a 4.5 kilo male baby with SATs of 70%. Um, about half of them don't have any associated congenital heart disease. So yes, they'll have a PFO when they're born. Yes, they'll have a ductus arteriosus, but there's nothing else associated. So those kids often don't have a heart murmur. So this will be the big blue baby boy with no murmur. So if it's a tet, they're gonna have a murmur most of the time, but these patients often do not. But that leaves another 50% with, with associated lesions, most often a VSD, quite often LV outflow tract obstruction. So if you think here, LV outflow tract obstruction is really subpulmonary stenosis. Um, now, it, later in the talk, when we talk about arterial switch operations, if you do an arterial switch, suddenly that LV outflow tract obstruction goes from being subpulmonary stenosis to being subaortic stenosis. So these kids are blue from the get-go, often really blue, and often acidotic because they're so blue. How do they do? They do poorly. So looking at survival in unoperated transpositions, this is the simple detranspositions, the kids without VSDs, the kids without subpulmonary stenosis, pretty rare for them to live beyond about two months of age. There are these patients, this is kind of all comers here, they're the rare patients that have a VSD, which allow them to mix a little bit more easily. They also have LV outflow tract obstruction, so pulmonary stenosis, which is going to prevent too much pulmonary blood flow. And so some of those patients can actually survive for years without any sort of intervention. So the problem is this parallel circulation. We need to figure out how to get some of the blue blood to the lungs, some of the pink blood to the body. We can put them on prostaglandin, open up a ductus arteriosus up here. That's going to be a really good place for blue blood in the aorta to go across into the pulmonary arteries because the Aorta is going to be a higher resistant circulation. It's not going to be a really good place for the opposite. It's not going to be a real good place for pink blood here to shunt across the ductus into the aorta. Atrial septum is a really good place for that. Take a deep breath in. Your right atrial pressure goes up. You're going to push a little bit of that blue blood over to the left atrium. Breathe out. The opposite happens. You get this back and forth circulation. So here's a transposition patient with a couple of little holes in the atrial septum, but certainly uh, not a great place for shunting there. Um, so balloon atrial septostomy, a catheter with a balloon at the end is inserted up and across the foramen ovale, the balloon is blown up and you jerk. And hopefully you end up with something that kind of looks like this, with, which is a nice floppy atrial septum where you can certainly imagine the blood kind of shunting bidirectionally. And this procedure will often take a kid who's got sats of 50 and severe acidosis and almost immediately turn them into a much more stable kid with sats in the 80s. So then what? So the, the initial repairs, and I use that term repair kind of loosely, maybe palliation is a better, better term here, were the atrial switch procedures, the mustard procedure, the sinning procedure, basically two different ways to accomplish the same thing. So let's get our SVC and IVC blood, baffle it across the atrial septum so it goes into the LV and then out the pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary venous, pink blood here is excluded from that and ends up going into the RV and out the aorta. So you're, you're pink now um, and everything should be great. 
Here's a nice MRI picture of that that kind of shows, especially this SVC baffle here. You can look at this and imagine how easy it would be for that to get obstructed in there, especially if you put a pacemaker lead through that area. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Here's a picture of the kind of pulmonary venous side, some pulmonary veins coming in here, baffling across the atrial septum, tricuspid valve, big dilated right ventricle that's not squeezing so hot. This LV is happy as can be. It's pumping blood to the low resistance uh, pulmonary bed, but the RV is having trouble here. So how do these patients do? Um, they have problems. So if you look out at 39 years, about 68% survival. Event-free survival, only 19% at 39 years. We'll talk about what some of those events are. So just looking at the picture, we'll tell you what can go wrong. The sinus node sitting up here is prone to dysfunction. Over half of these patients, as they get into adulthood, are not going to be in sinus rhythm. They typically run on the bradycardic side. There is a lot of suture material in the atria. So atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, really common specifically some atypical forms of, of atrial flutter. This RV was not designed to pump to the aorta. It's prone to fail. You can get heart failure from RV, uh, RV dysfunction. The tricuspid valve is having to deal with those high pressures. It's prone to leak. And you can get into this vicious cycle where the tricuspid valve leaks, the RV becomes dysfunctional. That dilates the RV. The tricuspid valve leaks even more and a nasty cycle of progressive heart failure. Um, baffle obstruction, most commonly in the SVC baffle, sometimes in the IVC baffle, luckily rarely in the pulmonary venous baffle because that's much harder to address with, with catheterization. Um, but you can see kind of an SVC obstruction syn syndrome in some of these patients, but often they present with really weird symptoms, fatigue, dizziness, exercise intolerance. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Baffle leaks, so if you had a little leak in this baffle, it would be a place where blue blood could shunt right to left at lower your sats, potentially act as a conduit for emboli to get into the systemic side um, of the heart and go out and cause strokes or other embolic problems. Um, and then pulmonary hypertension in a subset of these groups, but can be very bad because if we get to a point of needing a heart transplant in these patients and they have pulmonary hypertension, suddenly we can't do transplant. So here's a patient um, who presented with, with exercise intolerance. You see the pacemaker leads going across this SVC baffle, and you see how tight this area is. This patient actually responded really well to a balloon dilation, which we were surprised by. It's been about eight years, and he's still doing well. But a lot of patients don't. Um, a lot of patients end up needing to have... That air, the pacemaker leads extracted, the area stented open, and the new pacemaker leads put back in. All right, so my pearls about the atrial switch, SVC baffle obstruction can present with really subtle signs, fatigue, dizziness, and, and echo has a hard time showing this stuff. So if you aren't really sure that you see it, you need to think about MRI, CT, or cath, or something to look for that SVC baffle obstruction. I've had a number of patients with, you know, two millimeter of mercury gradients across that area and you fix it and they feel a million times better. You need to be absolutely sure there's no obstruction or even a hint of obstruction in that area before you go putting pacemaker leads across there. Intraatrial reentrant tachycardia, atypical A flutter, often will present with like an atrial rate of 220, two to one conduction and a ventricular rate of 110. And one of the P waves is kind of buried in the, in the preceding T wave. Um, and you get a phone call from the emergency room saying your patient's here, they're short of breath, but they're in sinus tachycardia at 110. These patients typically run a little bit bradycardic, so be really suspicious if you hear that. There's a good chance they're really in flutter and it's not being recognized. We're gonna skip through that. So now to the arterial switch operation really 80s into the 90s that this became the standard approach because of all those problems associated with the, with the atrial switch operations. Um, people have moved on to the arterial switch. So it is what it sounds like. The posterior pulmonary artery and the anterior aorta are cut and, and the pulmonary artery is pulled anterior, which can lead to a lot of problems with pulmonary artery stenosis and issues in the, in the RV outflow. 
Um, the aorta is moved posteriorly, but the tricky part for the surgeons are these coronary arteries, which need to be cut off and moved back to the neo-aorta. Um, and anatomic coronary variations are really common in these kids. Um, and rarely these, uh, these coronary abnormalities can, can prevent an arterial switch or at least can complicate the arterial switch. So as a pediatric cardiologist, one of the things that stresses me out is trying to diagnose these before surgery because I know if I don't, the surgeon's going to let me know about it afterwards. So here's a patient that was cathed because they needed uh, some stenting up in the, in the pulmonary arteries. And lo and behold, in this asymptomatic patient, which there is a stenosis in this coronary artery right here. So one of the kind of dreaded complications of the arterial switch is, is proximal coronary artery stenosis, um, although often the patients are asymptomatic when they have it. So how do these patients do? Just to summarize briefly, they do much, much better. So 97% 25-year survival. Um, there was some sudden death and some MI, but these were in kids that were really, really sick. These weren't in those kids that were doing great, which is the majority of them. Um, if you look at arrhythmia-free survival, 97% at 25 years, that's awesome. Freedom from adverse cardiovascular events, 93% at 25 years. Um, about 5% or so in this study with documented coronary anomalies, although often we don't know what to do if we find those. But here, 60% with at least some degree of RV outflow um, or pulmonary artery problems, and that's really where we often have to intervene on these patients. The neoaortic valve, you know, it used to be the pulmonary valve, but you did the switch. Now it's functioning as an aortic valve. That root is prone to getting enlarged over time and occasionally can result in, in progressive aortic insufficiency that needs to be cared for as well. Um, and then if you look at the need for surgical or catheter-based intervention, some of these patients need that. And almost always, you don't have to read all of this, but almost always the need for intervention is pulmonary artery pulmonary valve RV outflow track work. So my pearls regarding the arterial switch operation, the current recommendations are for some form of imaging of the coronaries after the arterial switch. My approach with this is I wait until the kids are kind of early teens, 13, 12, 13, because they won't need to be sedated for a CT scan or for um, MRI is getting better, although I often use CT scan. Um, and, and typically, they aren't really in the hardcore varsity athletic type things at that point. So we'll screen their coronaries. Overall, these kids do really well, although I think if we've learned anything as being adult congenital heart disease doctors is that a surgeon figures out this awesome surgery and patients do really well for 30, 40 years, and suddenly we realize, uh-oh, there's a problem. So I think the jury is still out on, that, on this, but it's certainly reassuring. Um, we're going to skip through that as well and skip through that and get to L transposition. So congenitally corrected transposition, why the L? Okay, so this is weird for people who don't do congenital heart disease. The RV is on the left. The LV is on the right. Weird stuff, okay? And the aorta is coming off anterior but leftward. That's the levo up there, the L. Why do we call it congenitally corrected? Because, well, blue blood from the right atrium is going into an LV, but there's transposition. So that LV is squeezing that blue blood out to the pulmonary arteries, pink blood from the left atrium into the right ventricle, but out the aorta. So you're pink. So it's kind of like God corrected the transposition here. There is a small subgroup of these patients where this is all they've got. They've got L transposition, but no other associated lesions. And these are the patients that get diagnosed when they're 20. Sometimes these are the patients that get diagnosed when they're 85 on an autopsy. Um, so these are patients that can live for a long time without knowing they have this. But most of these patients have something else wrong with them. They'll have a VSD, they'll have pulmonary stenosis, something else. Um, and quite frequently, as Ari pointed out, their tricuspid valve is quite often abnormal, often ebstenoid. And remember, that tricuspid valve is on the systemic side. So it's dealing with systemic pressures, and if it leaks, it's gonna leak even more. So that can really cause problems. So without palliative surgery, about 20 to 30% of these kids will die in the first year. There's about a 2% per year risk of developing heart block. So we really have to watch for that.
systemic RV dysfunction is common. Same as we talked about with the mustard and the sinnings, you get RV dysfunction, tricuspid insufficiency, and that vicious cycle develops. So when to intervene is a tough question. How do these patients do? Um, kind of looking at patients, group one were the patients with associated lesions, VSDs, PS, that kind of thing. Group two were patients without. By 45 years of age, two-thirds of this group have heart failure. A quarter of these patients have heart failure. So there are issues with this as well. All right, so here's a patient of mine, an adult patient who has um, a nice, big, poorly functioning left-sided right ventricle. The RV is, I mean, the LV over on the right is happy. It's squeezing out to the lungs. He had his mechanical mitral uh, tricuspid valve placed back when he was about five. He's got pacemakers here. He's not the most compliant guy in the world. He's maybe got some associated thrombus here. Who knows, maybe there's some thrombus up there as well because he doesn't like to take his Coumadin. Um, but this is often the RV we're looking at when we care for these patients. And what to do about it? Well, if they don't need anything done, maybe you don't need to do anything. Um, if they have VSDs or PS, maybe you could just fix that stuff and leave the RV pumping to the aorta, the conventional repair. Certainly an option. You're going to have to worry at least about their tricuspid valve and whether or not you need to replace that valve. What about the anatomic repair, the double switch? Pretty crazy. You're actually going to do like an atrial switch here to get the blue blood to the RV, but then do an arterial switch so that that RV squeezes out to the pulmonary arteries. You have normal saturations, you'll have a systemic LV, really big surgery, really should only be done in centers that have a lot of experience with this, and that's all I'm gonna talk about with that. And then finally, I think that's it. All right, thank you.